8.6 springs and tension number 13 how is the change in the length of a spring related a to the magnitude f o s the the force exerted by an object object on the spring that's f o s so if we redraw that here FOS. How is the change in the length? Right? X minus X zero. That's your change in length. How is that related to the force exerted by the object on the spring? Okay? So we're talking about the magnitude. Magnitude. So it's just a magnitude. Okay? Well, we know that it is directly proportional, the change in length is directly proportional to the force. Okay, and it's proportional via the spring constant K. Okay? B, uh, how is this change in length? And by the way, if you, uh, whether you, you stretch it or you compress it, the change in length is proportional to that force, whether that force is a stretching force or a compression, a compressing force. Okay, B, to the how is the change in length of a spring related to the magnitude F S O, the the force of the spring on the object uh, exerted by the spring on the object. Okay, so it's going to be identical. Because remember, as long as we are operating in the linear region, make sure you understand what that means, the force of the spring on the object is the magnitude of the force of the spring on the object equals the magnitude of the force of the object on the spring. Okay? So remember, if the spring is, if the object is stretching the spring, then the spring is applying an equal and opposite restoring force. Okay? The spring always wants to be restored to its equilibrium position. So if the object is compressing the spring, then the spring is uh, applying an equal and opposite restoring force. So if you stretch the spring, the spring wants to go back to its equilibrium position. If you compress the spring, the spring wants to go back to its equilibrium position. 14, what is an elastic force? It is a force that uh, it's related to springs, right? And it is a force where it is reversible. You apply the force, the object moves back to its original position. Okay? So, give me one second quickly while I get back to you now. It is an elastic force is a force exerted by an object that is reversibly deformed. Right? So, we apply the force to the spring. Maybe that's its equilibrium position. We stretch it. And if we let it go, then that spring will go back to its original uh, position. But an inelastic force is one where you permanently deform. Permanently deform. Okay? So that is an inelastic force. Elastic force is, it's deformation, but it's not permanent. It's reversible. Okay. Number 15. Under what conditions is a pulling force exerted by a hand on one end of a rope, a spring, or a thread transmitted undiminished to a block attached to the other end? Transmitted undiminished. What does that mean? Transmitted undiminished. 
Okay, well in the textbook they give this example. Okay, so you've got a thread, a rope, or a spring. A spring, a rope, or a thread. It's attached to the ceiling on the one end. And you've got a block with a certain mass. Okay, attached there. So if we draw a free body diagram of this object, I'm just going to call it this object here, that one, or that one, or that one, whether it's a spring, rope, or thread. We draw the free body diagram. If, this is the thing, if this object has significant inertia, then in the free body diagram, okay, we need to include both the force of gravity, called ES, on the spring, okay, and we need to include the force of the brick on the spring. So this is a free body diagram of the spring. Okay, so of course we need to include the force of the brick on the spring. But if it has a significant mass, inertia, we also need to include the force of gravity pulling down the spring. And then of course we've got the force of the ceiling on the spring. However... If we look at a rope, it's exactly the same setup as that. But And so we've got the force of the brick on the rope. But the inertia of the rope is much less than the inertia, the mass, of the spring. So you can see that that little vector there is smaller. So the force of gravity on the rope is smaller okay so and then we've got the force of the ceiling on the rope as you can see as you can see this force here is not transmitted undiminished to, from one end to the other because it's also got this gravitational force here this force of the of the brick is not transmitted undiminished to this side right because it's also got this force of gravity. However, if this inertia is so small, then we can ignore, practically ignore, the force of gravity on the thread, on this um, item here. And so this force of the brick will be transmitted undiminished to this side, meaning this force, this force that is being applied to the thread is the same force that's being applied to this end. Whereas the force that is applied on this end in this situation is not the same as the force that the rope applies to the ceiling because it, you have to take into account this force. Similarly here, this force of the brick, if you want to, uh, the force of the brick over here is not the same as the force being applied here because it has, we have to take into account this gravitational force. So in this case, the force applied to the ceiling is larger than simply the force of the brick down over here. Whereas over here, the force of the brick pulling down is the same as the force uh, being transmitted to the ceiling. So the force exerted on one end of a rope spring or thread is transmitted undiminished to the other end provided the force of gravity on the rope spring or thread is much smaller than the forces that cause the stretching so if this force of gravity on the rope spring or thread is much smaller than than this force of the of the object on this end then we can ignore it we can ignore it. And then this force is transmitted right through the, um, the, uh, the thread, rope, or spring to the other end. Okay? Hope that makes sense.